Hello, I'm Fiona Sitkin, a former Fulbright scholar and now a board member of Fulbright New Jersey. I'm very happy to welcome you to the third of our webinar in the series 2022. As you know, Fulbright Association is comprised of alumni, people currently on exchanges, and all supporters of international education. There are 54 US alumni chapters, at least one per state. Fulbrighters come from over 165 countries. And what ties them together is our commitment to advance mutual understanding, tolerance, and cultural cooperation worldwide. Isn't that a beautiful mission? Now, because Fulbright New Jersey is a diverse group, We've invited our members to share their stories and experiences with the others. We also invite some guests who are famous thought leaders. Why? Because we want to have a broader and deeper vision of the world, the world which is changing right in front of our eyes at a breakneck speed. In the coming months, you will hear from board members of Fulbright, New Jersey. For example, Dr. John Specchio, a food scientist, Dr. Jennifer Chen, a researcher into early childhood education, Dr. Tina Lesher, a retired professor and former newspaper reporter. Think of these upcoming meetings as chances to meet interesting people, learn something new, and maybe enlarge your circle of good friends and uh, contacts. Today, our guest, Professor Bruce Wexler of Yale University, will be speaking about brain and culture in a digital world. Although you all read his bio on our flyer, let me introduce him here properly, okay? Bruce Wexler's work on neurosystems helped launch the field, the field of digital neurotherapy in 1997. In turn, this led to development of non-pharmacological treatments for depression, and ADHD. That's a revolution in the field, no less. In 2006, Professor Wexler published a book, Brain and Culture, Neurobiology, Ideology, and Social Change, a seminal book on cultural neuroscience. And who do you think helped us contact Dr. Wexler and reach out to him, reach out to such a true trailblazer of neuroscience. Our own board member, Virgil Blanco, Professor Dr. Virgil Blanco is also a president emeritus of Fulbright, New Jersey. Now to you, Virgil, the floor is yours. Well, I won't take too much of your time, especially because we all want to hear Dr. Wexler. But the only thing I have to say is that basically, I've always been very much interested in culture, different cultures, and I've also been very much interested in cognition. Those are two of my favorite topics, if not my favorite topics. So when I read uh, Brain and Culture, written by Dr. Wexler in 2006, I said, I, had, I have to meet this guy, definitely. So I call uh, Yale and I set up an appointment to see him. And it, it was really a very uh, satisfying, uh, very good experience meeting him in person and discussing with him at the time his trip to China, uh, where he had visited uh, at some point. Uh, so uh, afterwards, I had kept reading all his work. And uh, up to this day, I find it uh, really fascinating. And uh, I want to share my enthusiasm and my excitement about this topic and about this man who has really um, has been a trailblazer in this uh, field and uh, to share it with people who are interested in uh, education, cognition, and culture. 
uh, and no place, no venue better than the Fulbright uh, Forum. And this is why we have Dr. Wexler here. Now, as I see people are coming in from different parts of the country at uh, different times. So I'm trying to, um, uh, trying to make my uh, introduction a little bit longer than I intended so that they can uh, sign in as we are talking right now. Fiona, did I miss anything or should I have said something else? That's all right, everything's fine, everything's fine. So if you are done, Virgil, the floor is going to Bruce, right? Yeah, so everybody- You're very you. welcome, Bruce. Thank you, and you can hear me all right? Yeah, yes, I think sure. so. Terrific, well, thank you, Fiona and Virgil for the introductions. It's also very meaningful for me. When you write a book, you're wondering, you know, how many people will read it? What will they think about it? And it's special when people both read, think deeply about it, and then reach out to you to follow up. And so we've been had this contact together now for a decade and uh, very much appreciate the opportunity today. And I um, thank all of you who, are, who have joined us uh, for your interest in, in my work. I'm going to share my screen now and uh, we'll give my formal talk. Uh, for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have time for discussion afterwards. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Can everybody see just somebody? Uh, Fiona, can you see the screen all right? Yes, yes, Correct. everything. Okay, good. So my talk this afternoon rests on two assumptions. First, I'm assuming everything about our brains and minds are qualities of physical matter and consistent therefore with the laws of the universe that govern all physical matter. And therefore all properties of the mind are properties of the physical matter of the brain. Although there are many mysteries about how the brain works, not least of which is how we have conscious experience. Now, I realize that many people endorse an somewhat alternate position where there can be qualities that we would associate with the mind or spirit that are independent of the brain. And there are a variety of ways to integrate the idea of, the idea of corporality of the mind with the essence existence of an extracorporeal spirit, soul, or essence. And this is an important topic, but one which I'm not going to take up in the relatively short time we have this afternoon. My second assumption is based on the fact that the brain is a highly evolved and complex living entity made up of many billions of single cells. So my assumption is that aspects of understanding brain and mental function in relation to their physical basis are the same as understanding the relation of living organisms to their physical constituents. In other words, of understanding life itself. Now the reconciling life itself with the basic laws of physics um, turned out to be a challenge for leading physicists in the 1940s, who were worried that some features of life might actually be inconsistent with the laws of thermodynamics. Nobel laureate Schrodinger wrote in his book, What is Life? Life in general and the brain in particular require orderliness, while the tendency of physical matter is always to lose order or structure through random movement of atoms. His contemporary, Leon Brion, uh, Harvard and um, Bell Labs physicist, wrote A living organism has special properties which enable it to resist destruction, to heal its wounds, and to cure occasional sick sickness. This is a very strange behavior. And nothing similar can be observed about inert matter. These are not in living organisms some power that prevents the action of the second principle of thermodynamics. The adult individual is a most extraordinary example of a chemical system in unstable equilibrium. The system is unstable undoubtedly since it represents a very elaborate organization, the most improbable structure uh, hence a system with a very low entropy, which is further shown when death occurs and entropic disorder follows shortly after. 
So we see here from these statements, uh, three key features of living things and their parts. One, the function that there are functional properties not seen in non-living matter. That the living matter and the brain certainly are, are distinguished by the highly complex organization and the ability to resist the tendency of all matter to lose organization and structure in the move towards randomness and increased entropy. So Schrodinger and, and Brouillon actually helped uh, solve this last issue about resisting entropy by proposing the concept of negative entropy or neg entropy that living things import from the environment to counter the internal tendency of their system to regress or disorganize uh, with entropic uh, pressure. Um, the idea is that living things are an open system. So they can import things from outside in to counter these other characteristics of a closed system. And in fact, maybe the only closed system is the universe itself where the laws of physics apply um, more precisely. So what is this neg entropy that comes into the open system of life and into the brain? Well, basic part of it to think about most fundamentally and easily to begin with that they did in fact, was that it's energy from food where the structures that are consumed, molecular structures are broken down in digestion, releases the energy that was in them and that is used internally to maintain structure and resist entropy. And interesting in that regard is that there has been evolutionary pressure, positive evolutionary selection for enzymes that increase the efficiency of these processes. That is, less and less energy is required to resist entropy. So you can see further evidence of the struggle between life and entropy and the value of life being able to do it at less um, uh, prevail with the consumption of less and less energy. But the brain has a very interesting additional type of neg entropy. The structure is actually imported from the environment and the structure is preserved, contrasting with the role of the stomach in this neg entropy process, where the ingested molecular structures are broken down to release energy to maintain established structures. In brain, the raw materials exist in the brain and the information and structure are imported. And it has evolved to be the dominant mode of shaping and maintaining the structure and function of the human brain. Now, as Norbert Wiener said also in the mid part of the last century, the uh, mathematics prodigy and founder of cybernetics said, we are not stuff that abides, but patterns that perpetuate themselves. And an important additional step, a pattern is a message and may be transmitted as a message. You will see the importance of that as, as I continue with my comments. So what about the complex organization and associated functionalities that distinguish living things and certainly the brain? How does it organize to work? Well, this is what they thought in the 19th century phrenology that individual sections of the brain were dedicated, created, evolved for every one of our different types of possible moral and cognitive functions. So you have an, an, an area for generosity and edit, uh, one for uh, empathy, one for greed, one for mathematics, all broken up like that. Well, what we know about neuroscience, it's hard to imagine how something could have evolved that way. And that's not the way the brain works. It works in distributed systems that integrate millions of neurons across the whole brain to produce the most simple functions. So our model now is that the brain works in dynamically reconfiguring, hierarchically organized functional systems that integrate millions of neurons. And that the functions of interest that we're interested in, say cognition, emotion, how we experience the world and, ourself, and ourselves, these come from the combination of smaller functional components. Let me give you an example about this, what this is. We, we talk about combining these components, they create a larger system that has emergent properties. Now this is not limited to living things. Water itself is a wonderful example of what an emergent property is. The property, water has many properties. Water is two, two atoms of hydrogen, one of oxygen. 
If you said, oh, I want to understand these properties by breaking this into its parts so I can see how it works, you've lost the properties. The properties of waters do not exist at all in individual oxygen or hydrogen atoms. They only emerge new functionality when they're combined. Another way to understand emergent properties is to look at a le a letters in an alphabet. So here we have three letters, right? A, E, and T. And um, somebody has raised their hand. I just wanna make sure there's not problems. I'll stop for questions in, uh, a little bit periodically, but are there any technical issues? Can everybody hear me still and see everything all right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, so uh, Fiona, you can note that uh, George raised his hand and, and I don't know if he's gonna write something in chat and you can interrupt me if need be. But I will stop at a certain point just to see if there are any questions from people following me here. But we will have time at the end. So now consider the example of letters of an alphabet. The function of the alphabet, right, is to create things that convey meaning. The individual letters don't. They're different from each other. You can't have an alphabet of all A's, but they don't have the function yet until they're combined. And the function emerges from their combination. And note here that the same three elements can be combined in different ways to produce very different meaning, very different functions. And you can have a functional unit and add some another component to it and it changes its function altogether. That's the way the brain reconfigures its pieces. Now the analogy doesn't stop here. What about words? They can pay a certain amount of the function, but when you put them in sentences, you have more emergent properties and into paragraphs, articles, and books and you get more and more complex functions from combining the components. If you were to say, I wanna take these apart so I can understand it better, and I'm gonna give you a count of the exact number of times I use every letter of the alphabet in my talk or in a paper you're reading, that would be a precise description of the paper, but it would not tell you anything about what the paper means. All the emergent properties would be lost. If we go to compare this to the uh, analogy continued to the brain, it's like the neurons are letters. There are microcircuits of neighboring neurons we could call words, local circuits put together to make paragraphs, but it's neurosystems that integrate all the local, many local circuits in varying combination that create cognition and emotion. This is a brain imaging study of brain activation when you read words. Look how widespread it is. It's not one of those phrenology areas. It's a system all around the brain. This is another one of what's supposedly the G factor of general intelligence supported by a whole foundational system. So going back to our three key features of living things and their parts, their functional properties not seen in living matter, emergent properties we've just talked about from the complexity of organization, it resists uh, entropy through neg entropy, and it has this highly complex organization. But where does the organization come from to start with? We said, I said that by organizing into units, you get emergent properties, but where does the actual organization of our brains come from? Well, there are two evolutionary changes, simple, elegant changes in evolution that make all this possible. First of all, in mammalian evolution up through rodents, if evolution <coughs> wanted to increase the number of cells in the brain, the size of the cells increased in the same proportion. The change in evolution in primates was that cell number could increase while cell size stays the same. So you can pack many more brain set neurons into the same volume. If a rodent brain was the same size as the human brain, it would have 12 billion instead of 100 billion neurons because each of their neurons would be much bigger. So, and then with the fact that in the human brain, each neuron is directly connected to 10,000 others, you can see how the system complexity increases exponentially with this increase in cell number. That's the first biological evolution change that made the organization of our brains uh, what it is. The other was that the brain developed to become more responsive to environmental input. This study looked at 35,000 genes that were not changed over 80 million years of evolution from rodents to chimps and said, which ones changed between chimps and humans? 49 and 47 of them, they didn't make some new protein or building block. They turned other genes on and off. 
we call that epigenetic control, epigenetic neuroplasticity. And it made the genes get turned on and off in response to what? To sensory input. Um, Hubon Weisel won the Nobel Prize for showing the degree to which all mammalian brains, uh, their structure and function is shaped after birth by stimulation from the environment. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Just to show you how powerful this neuroplasticity is, this study done at MIT, they surgically rerouted visual input into the normal auditory or listening parts of the ferrets, a little animal, the ferret's brain. And they said, will the ferrets be able to see with the listening part of their brain? And what will that part of the brain look like under the microscope in terms of its cytoarchitecture? Because the visual cortex looks like a TV screen with pixels. We call them ocular dominance columns. The auditory cortex is also organized in an entirely different way, a tonotropic organization. Well, yes, the ferrets could see with the listening part of the brain and look what happened to it. It reorganized. The cells reorganized to look like the visual cortex with ocular dominance columns. This, let me remind you, is the most early basic stage of brain organization, auditory sensory input registration. It's not like I'm saying that the brain reorganizes in the systems that support values, thoughts, reading, these other types of human functions. These are the most basic parts of the brain reorganized and refunctionalized based on the input they receive. What happens to a human being who's born blind? What happens to their visual cortex? Does it do nothing? It turns into another auditory processing area, plasticity. Now I've talked about visual input, auditory input. There's another important part of input, somatosensory input from other members of your species. And particularly when you're little and your brain is being shaped from parenting, parents and mothers. So this study was done by Michael Meany's group in Montreal looking at rat mothers. And they saw that just in the normal population variability, some rat mothers licked and groomed their babies more than others, high licking grooming and low licking grooming. Turned out uh, when grown up rats with high licking grooming mothers when they were little have a reduced stress response, better able to regulate it and better memory actually also. So they said, oh, how's that happening? Let's look at the genes that code for the receptors in the brain that turn down the stress response. And they found that the genes that turn down the stress response had become more active in the offspring who got a lot of licking and grooming by their mothers. Now, how do they become more active? Our DNA is, is we all have only one DNA right in our bodies, half from our mother and half from our fathers, but we have bones, we have eyes, we have hearts, we have all very different body parts from one DNA. It's because different parts of the DNA get turned on and off at different times to produce these very different functional outcomes. One way they get they're controlled is they're covered by a chemical group called a methyl group. And if a methyl group is on top of them, they can't be active. And what you see in the white bars is how much the methyl group has been reduced compared to the black bars. The black bars are the offspring of the low licking grooming mothers. The high licking grooming mothers, the methyl groups came off the genes to make the, the genes more active to produce more receptors that regulated the stress response. That's how powerful these mechanisms are. When we looked at uh, comparing humans and chimps, there's only 1.2% of our genes are different. That's famously pointed out because our behaviors seem to be quite different. But in the brain, there's a 10% difference in gene expression, 10 fold greater interspecies difference in gene expression than gene structure. Moreover, differences between different people in gene expression in their brains are twice as great as differences between different chimps in gene expression in their brains. In other words, environmentally driven changes in brain gene expression in humans increases more variability in our population in terms of our brain structure and function in response to our environments. 
So now we complete this little chart here. We know that the functional properties not seen in living matter are emergent properties from the complexity of living matters. That the highly complex organization in humans and in our brains came uh, made possible by these two evolutionary changes, increased cell numbers and epigenetic mechanisms sensitive to environmental stimulation. And we know that neg entropy preserves the structure inside our brains and inside our bodies. We're going to see now an interesting connection between the neg entropy and these other two features um, of importing uh, of the brain structural organism. Yeah, somebody saying something? Okay, everything okay, Fiona? Yes. Yes, everything's fine. I haven't received anything. Okay, good. Okay, so with that, uh, uh, we can, if there's any uh, sort of question that you think it makes it hard to follow what I've said already, this is a little play, a juncture where I could take one or two, Fiona. Can you see if there are any in the chat or in the, um, raising their hands and somebody wants to ask me a question. I don't see any questions on the chat at present time. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so now we have this, uh, this system, right? Which uh, is our human brain is distinguished by its complex organizations. It's emergent properties that create these capabilities that other animals don't have. And, that, uh, and its ability to be responsive to environmental input as are other mammals in shaping their brains. Here is a key next distinction. Humans are the only animals that shape the environment that shapes their brains. Think about that. Animals now are impacted by the human environment some, but they're still basically living, right? And they don't change the environment in the land of the earth, the trees, the sun, the rain, the cold, the heat created by the earth itself. We humans have changed the environment that shapes our brains. These culturally generated, human-made, external organizational templates are features of the external environment created, now listen to this, by multiple individuals and in another layer of interactive process. That's culture, Virgil, that's um, social interaction, that's writing, that's science. Another layer of interactive process creates new environmental structures that are modified by each generation and shape brain function and structure by turning different genes on and off. We can make these links with confidence. Now, going from the basic structure of, of the brain synapses and systems to its genes being turned on and off to socially created templates, because remember, the brain needs those templates. It imports them to maintain its very essence, its life, its structure against entropy. So you might ask then, well, do people from different cultures, do their brains work differently? And to some degree, they do. Here's a study they did comparing Americans and Chinese. They showed them pictures like this, and they said that we're going to ask you afterwards whether you've seen this picture before, so you have to remember them. And the pictures, you can see, have a big object in the center and a background, right? Both of them do. And then they looked at what did the Chinese and American subjects look at in the picture? They track their eye movements across the screen. The blue lines are Americans, the red lines are Chinese. The thick lines are when you look at the center object. The red lines are when you look at the background. And look at the difference. You can see it right here in this part. This is the, the period between 500 and, and uh, 800 milliseconds of, uh, after you first look at the image. The Chinese are spending equal amount of time on the object in the background. The Americans have already directed their focus to the background and, and not looking much at, the, uh, I mean, to the center big object and not looking much at the background. You can see other periods here where, where, where it pretty much continues. Look at the difference here. The Chinese now are spending all this time looking at the background, the thin red line, compared to the time looking at the center object. And out here, you know, the Americans still looking more at the center object here, about equal. So we really take in and process information differently. Now, this is the next little shift in my talk in the sense of another key point in this development of these pieces I put together for you. I said that in childhood and adolescence, children have limited ability to act on and change the environment. 
and the brain shapes itself to the cultural environment, creating a homology or harmony between internal and external structures. When we're adults, we now have established internal structures and like other ones, they are self-sustaining. And now we can act on the world. And what do we do? We spent a lot of time acting on the world to make it match what's already inside of us. We prefer, we're more comfortable with a homology of harmony between internal and external structures. Perhaps going back to the co energy costs and entropic risks of changing components of established complex organizations. But it's an experimentally established fact, I'll show you some of the data, that we like it better when there's a fit. We like the familiarity. You'll also note in this transgenerational process, the balance between change and stability created by the malleability of the brain in youth and the resistance to change in adults. So the malleability allows cumulative cross-generational development of new function and structure. But the adult conservative part limits too much or too rapid change. And that's a general principle of biological response systems. You don't want to change too much in response to what might be a temporary change in the environment. In all sorts of chemical systems inside cells, once the environment has shown itself to be changed in a more stable way, then new processes are activated to, that cost more energy, but in the long run, it's paid off by greater efficiency by changing the way the, brain, the, the cell react, uh, processes or functions in the new environment. But if there's a temporary change, you only want a temporary adjustment. You don't want to be changing back and forth. So, that, uh, that's, so that's a critical shift in our relationship to our environments and some of the features about it, which we'll return to when we talk about the digital world. So how is it that all the adults maintain this consistency between their internal existing established internal structures and in, in the outside world? Well, for one, we actually have increased perceptual sensitivity to stimuli we're, that are consistent with our internal structures. If we've already seen something before and established that as a feature of our environment, we see it at lower thresholds. We hear it at lower thresholds. When we're confronted with information that is inconsistent with our internal structures, we ignore it, discredit it, forget about it. Inconsistent with our internal opinions, for example. And we affiliate, affiliate with like-minded individuals and groups. So we keep getting reinforced with things that are the same as what's inside of us. Democrats marry Democrats. And we know the strong pressures for people to marry within their ethnic groups or religious groups. Now, it is very, important and real and physiological, the connections between the internal representation of something and its external fate and existence in the world. Here's just a, a clever demonstration of that. The researchers measured testosterone levels in male Brazilian and Italian soccer fans prior to a World Cup final that the Brazilian team won. After the Brazilian team won, the Brazilian male fans' testosterone rose 28%, and the defeated Italians decreased by a similar amount. These men were nowhere near the playing field. What happened was something external that was part of them, their team had a defeat, and it changed their own testosterone levels. I said that people like things they're familiar, familiar with. This was an easy experiment. They showed people geometric forms, meaningless shapes. Some of them they saw one time, some five times, 10 or 25 times. And then they asked them to indicate which shapes they liked better. They liked the shapes better that they had simply seen more often. Same thing with faces of strangers, with melodies of music, with Chinese characters for Westerners who can't read them simply the ones they've seen more often they like more. And this goes into social phenomena too. Korean Americans experience Korean surnames as more emotionally positive than Japanese ones, while the reverse is true for Japanese Americans. White Americans experience unconsciously processed pictures of black Americans as emotionally negative and pictures of other white Americans as emotionally positive. 
So here I want to make a slight point about the pandemic. And I'm, I'm going to quote myself, actually, from an op-ed I had in the Financial Times. From birth, you'll be familiar with this, the function and structure of our brains are shaped by input from our human and human-made environments. The behaviors and routines of our families and the features and activities in our neighborhoods, communities, schools, houses of worship become part of us. We need the favorite familiar places and faces to which we returned day after day, week after week, literally to renew ourselves. And these have been taken from us by the pandemic. The fierceness of protests around the world that gyms and hair salons reopen, sports events resume, bars and restaurants reopen attest to the power of these losses. Hunger for these familiar environments overwhelms reason and caution. It helped me understand people's behavior that I couldn't before when I realized this. Now, there are times besides a pandemic when we cannot maintain this fit between internal and external worlds. One is bereavement or a very key component of the external world and internal world suddenly is gone from the external world. Another is immigration. When you find yourself surrounded living in a culture with very different from the one that shaped you. And the other is the meeting of cultures. Globalization, uh, a relatively new phenomenon in the one to 200,000 year history of homo sapiens. Immigration, here's a quote from Edward Said, a Palestinian American Columbia professor. Exile is strangely compelling to think about, but terrible to experience. It is the unhealable rift forced between a human being and a native place, between a self and its true home. Its essential sadness can never be surmounted. And here's something from Eva Hoffman, who left Poland when she was 12 for a good reason. It wasn't a comfortable place for her family to be. But this is what she wrote. The country of my childhood lives within me with a primacy that is a form of love. It has fed me language, perception, sounds, the humankind. It has given me the colors and furrows of reality, the, my first loves. The absoluteness of those loves can never be recaptured. No geometry of the landscape, haze in the hair, air, will live in us as intensely as the landscapes that we saw as the first and to which we gave ourselves wholly without reservations. She could have been a neuroscientist, right? I mean, she's writing here in poetic language what I've been trying to say earlier in the talk. So what about the meeting of cultures? What we've discussed thus far might make us concerned, right? People who are raised in different cultures, different perception, information processing, appearance, clothes, beliefs, foods, habits, language, and more. Different cultures create different public institutions, a different public space that you have to live inside of, from street names to places of worship. People are more comfortable with familiar things and environments. People usually surround themselves with like-minded people. This is a quote from a, an American who had lived in Europe for 15 years, an intellectual giant returning to his New York City for the first time after being abroad. As you go and come, the wonderment to which everything ministers and that is quickened well nigh to madness in some places, on some occasions by every face and every accent that meets your eyes, fed thus by a thousand sources is so intense as to be I say, irritating. Is not our instinct in this matter in general essentially the safe one, that of keeping the idea simple and strong and continuous so that it shall be perfectly sound? Yet on this free assault upon it, this readjustment of it in their monstrous, presumptuous interest, the aliens in New York seem perpetually to insist. That's a cosmopolitan man talking about what happened when immigrants came to New York. More of a scholarly approach, Mary Pratt writes at the contact, about the contact zone, the space in which peoples geographically and historically separated come into contact with each other and establish ongoing relations, usually involving conditions of coercion, radical inequality, and intractable conflict. So what about some of this cultural neuroscience? Does this support some of these problems? This is a study done at, at Peking University. When we see people in pain, 
parts of our brain that are active when we experience pain are also activated. Empathy circuits, we call it. It's a, similar to what I've been talking about, how the connections between internal and external overlap. So in this study, they showed subjects pictures of a woman getting either a hypodermic needle stuck into her cheek or a soft cotton swab stroking her cheek. Sometimes the women were Caucasian and sometimes they were Chinese. Well, and they looked at the brain activity and I'm gonna just call your attention to this one area here of the brain that's normally activated when you have pain. And this is what, and how you see how robustly it was activated when the Caucasian subjects looked at a Caucasian woman getting pain. But it didn't activate at all when they saw a Chinese woman getting pain. And it just was the reverse with the Chinese subjects. This area was strongly activated when they saw a Chinese woman in pain and not when they saw a Westerner. You know, one of the problems we face with our brains being shaped the way they are. Here's a cartoon that tries to capture part of it. The dog says to the cat, okay, here's the deal. I'll stop chasing you if you agree to become a dog. So now I wanna uh, conclude with some considerations of the implications of growing up and living in our digital world for the things that I've talked about. And, and Virgil, this is like, you know, an update. These were things to my, the book, which as Virgil said, was published in 2006 on Brain and Culture. I actually started writing it in 1991, uh, just as a, a personal effort to re-educate re myself in neuroscience. It didn't have the theme or ideas. They emerged from my just pursuing, you know, one foot in front of the other, following questions that I was curious about until I felt I could answer them. And then it took 10 years to get published, even though it was all written. Um, and so, but this is an update from it. So what do we think about the virtual, the virtual world? Well, first of all, it's a further divergence, right, from the natural world. It's a new type of human-made environment. And our children are raised almost exclusively now in a human-made environment and more and more and more in a digital environment made by humans. And they, what we can make in this environment is very different than what we made before by you know just building nicer houses and buildings, skyscrapers, that's pretty impressive and stuff. Cars and airplanes are pretty impressive. But we create living intelligent things, characters that you relate to as if they were another human almost that do not exist. Often they have human-like, but uh, look human-like, but they have powers that no human does. That becomes a new part of what our children grow up with in their world. We can create photos of people who do not exist. You can go to a site, that, a free site online, just keep clicking and put, makes a photo, of, shows a photo of a person who doesn't exist. It just looks like a picture of somebody who's real. We can alter the photos and videos, right? To distort reality. You can't tell the difference now. So how many different forms of reality can we create? You know, false information we talk about. And then virtual reality. We actually experience being in an artificial reality through multiple senses and motor movement. The types of things that shape our brains, we're now living in a world that doesn't exist anywhere on earth. It's created by new types of, of new means. And then we start to have to think about who's creating it, why are they creating it, and what's the effect of it. We see that uh, these can be very powerful because these are energy efficient, necantropic features of the environment that are easily modified and then transmitted to and ingested by large numbers of individuals. This idea of influencers is a, is a new idea, right? And who controls and regulates the influencers? Who creates the material that goes into this wide distribution? There was great control in our country and elsewhere when TV and radio were invented. Great control over it because they realized this was a social capability that belonged to, the, had to be regulated, belonged to the people because of its impact on information and stuff. And there were laws. Uh, broadcasting companies could not be owned by foreign entities, for example. And initially, as you remember the news, well, no, I'm old enough to remember that the news didn't have advertisements. You know, it was protected from commercial interests. 
That's how important that was. Now we have these more powerful, more rapid, widely uh, methods of creating environmental input that can be distributed to uh, large numbers of people without any control over who, very little control over who's doing it and what their motives are. And there's a big a group of critical theory developing now about uh, the fact that government and industry control neuroplastic development through digital monitoring and then the types of inputs that I'm talking about. And that traces this through different stages of history. And if you want from a Marxist perspective, different stages of organization and production where originally there was control over land and, 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 and then over you know, industrial means of production, new ones were created and controlled over an agrarian system that might've been more universally available. Then there was control over people's bodies with assembly lines and things like that, that controlled by uh, how they actually have to function. Then there's control over information. Now there's control over neuroplasticity. And it's done by large entities, government and industry, collecting large amounts of data and done with the advantage of, of machine intelligence. So it's a very different process. And we have to, uh, it takes more analysis to know what the significance of those differences are, but very different from what it used to be in terms of where these negentropic brain input structures necessary for our brains to function at all imported come from, who's controlling them and for what purposes. Is, is, the, is the fact that they can be made so fast now and so efficiently, how does it disrupt this change stability balance I talked about? Digital stimuli can be made hyper salient, right? That's what our specialists do. They make visual stimuli. It used to be that it took grand masters of art to make a, a, a beautiful image that somehow captured people's attention for generations. We make hyper salient stimuli that can be tested over and over again to see how they capture different parts of people's attention and activate different parts of their brains. And um, last thing I wanna comment on is the loss of the moderating effects of family and local community on extreme opinions and action. Up to now, you formed your opinions with a balance of inputs, as I've said. And if you developed the sort of deviant, unusual, extreme opinions, your behavior and ideas were challenged, modified, and controlled by important people in your community who also were important inside of you. Your parents, your family, your religious leaders, your teachers, they'd say, whoa, 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 you're going a little too far on that one. I don't really think that one's right. These were essential checks and balances. What happens now? Remember I said people like to affiliate with like-minded people. People with extreme ideas can find replacement online communities of people who have the same beliefs and are echo chambers of those opinions. And I think that's a major factor, frankly, that's creating to some type, uh, types of extremism and divisiveness in our culture today. So thank you. Those are my prepared comments and um, look forward to questions and comments for people. Thank you so much, Dr. Wexler. We have a comment here from George Simmons and he says, Silence. Having, been, having been born and spent my childhood days in vibrant multicultural environment, the immigrant melting pot, walk a block and hear a different language. I feel this gives me my intercultural focus. I've lived in three countries and felt fully at home. My cultural shock as an Ohio boy was California. <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's, absolutely, it's absolutely right. I mean, I, I did second track diplomacy in the Middle East and tried to find Israelis and Palestinians who already for their own reasons saw each other as humans and could respect it, each other humanity because of experience they happen to have. There's population variability in experiences like this. And the fact, George, that you can speak so many different languages is very important. Abba Ibn was said, as articulate as he was, to eventually be considered an inappropriate spokesperson for the Israeli government because the ability that he could read Arabic and read their poetry made him understand to be sensitive to aspects of their culture that he wouldn't otherwise have been. And so 
if you live in a multicultural environment uh, and grow up in it, it definitely changes your sensibilities. And I think it would be an encouraging thing. And that's why I think that integration of schools was a very important thing. And the fact that uh, in America, we see more, uh, we went through a period with different ethnic groups and racial groups getting more presence in popular media. It has hugely changed. You know, when I went to college, you know, there were 10 African Americans in my class of 1200. Now you go to a college campus and it's, you see, you know, people of all different races and ethnicities and people interacting with them on a personal level. And when you look on TV, it's not only, you know, white sitcoms that have the, uh, or uh, that are the only images you see of life and family, you see a variety of them. Ones. So I think the type of experience you're referring to, George, is a hopeful one. And that's actually, you know, what I first thought when I wrote the book about globalization and the internet, you know, that it could move that way. I didn't appreciate the concern I just outlined about how people who don't have that experience and inclination to start with can find people like themselves in the second chamber to make their, their, their opinions even more extreme. If there are any more questions, we'll welcome you to put them on the chat and I would be very happy to read them for Dr. Wexler. I can see them also now. Um, oh, you can see them too. All right. Because I stopped my screen share. George Simons wrote that we learn to be curious instead of furious about differences. George, I wish it would be true about all of us, about all of the society. We need to work very hard to make it true. That's my opinion. Well, maybe in France it is better, but here in the States, there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And my, one of the things I thought, about the book was that it actually provided more insight into some of the processes that make it difficult and also that are potentially then if you understand them ways like integration of schools and um, making positive images of, all, of different people in the mass media that you consume that can help make people curious. Um, and that's why with the Middle East work, we wanted to reclaim the public idea space. The NGO I created called A Different Future it was based on the book and the ideas that came out of the book. And I didn't discuss that in the book, but I just, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but I did discuss other conflicts that were driven that way. I mean, think about the Crusades where people walked. There wasn't a period of a lot of international travel, right? Hundreds of thousands of people walked from Europe to Palestine including the kings of Germany, England, and France, most of them died. And they did it because the Pope said, you know, Jerusalem, the jewel of the world is being contaminated by infidels. You have to go there. And by the way, if you kill Jews and gyps gypsies along the way, that's okay. Um, just this difference. Um, Dr. Wexler, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, I, if we look at history from Babel the biblical Bible to the present time, it seems that multicultural societies tend to implode. I'm referring to, for example, you know, the Balkans, mm. which were always um, Spain itself, uh, with the differences of uh, Jews, uh, Muslims, and Christians, and then the differences between the Galicians, the Basque, the Catalan. There's always that tension in that society, even looking at Roman, uh, the Roman Empire, how it imploded, the mm -hmm. Soviet Union, you know, it seems that that friction between uh, different cultures tend to create entropy. Yeah. yeah, you're right. No, no, they do. So when you, I mean, the only thing I was going to take issue with, but I think we're on the same page as you commented, if I listened to you comment further, was multicultural societies. The question is, you know, are they multicultural? Are they, are they pockets of people that are put next to each other? 
and then aggravated by you know economic things and other factors that play on them, they never really reach the integration. You want, I mean, I think America in some ways, now it could be, uh, I'm curious with George and others, and I see there's another question from somebody. There else. is a question. There yeah. is a comment and question from Holger Hanker. Yeah. Um, it says about a hundred years ago, we experienced new mass media, for example, mm -hmm. radio and TV, and found that they were abused by demagogues to manipulate people. We got smarter in our approach to consume as consumers of the media. Now we are still new to social media, online, etc. Might we expect to go to get smarter in our approach with consuming this media? Yeah. What does a brain scientist tell yeah, us? Yeah, yeah. well, that, that's, that's a great and hopeful question. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to challenge it at a couple of points. Um, one is, yes, some of us have gotten better with the media. But when you look at the opinions of false, the power of false information, even on certain news channels to continue people going back who believe that, they keep going back to that news channel and they keep taking uh, false information. I mean, we had a president who had no compunction about just saying things that weren't true and people you know, believed it. He wasn't even challenged by the religious leaders in this country, remarkable to me, who every day of their life devote themselves to certain values that he you know, transgressed every day of his life. And, they, and, and they, they were silent about it. So I'm not sure exactly about the, uh, how well our, on a population level we have gotten in, in controlling these things. But the other point I would say is uh, it remains to be seen, as you're saying, what we do about social media and uh, digital. But there are big, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the differences in power creating hyper salient stimuli, you know, uh, the ability to create sub communities from all over the world of different types of extreme people, the, um, the, um, yeah, the, 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 the way that they can so skillfully be with machine intelligence. Another way to describe this new era is that we're entering the era of combined human and machine intelligence, literally. And the machine intelligence power right now resides in big entities. They've got the big machine intelligence. They're collecting huge amounts of information that they can integrate. And they then control what information they present. We know that to people and how they present it. And so uh, I appreciate, Holger, your comment. I just um, am not as optimistic as I'd like to be about it. There is another comment, if you want to take it, on yeah. Q&A that was in a different box. Okay. Um, children play hours a day of online games, such as Fortnite that essentially creates an in-game family and uh, right. that is protected under tremendous pressure and stress. When your tribe wins, uh, it's only when all the other tribes are dead. Wow. The stress response activation, oh my God, that's horrible, is akin to, to a traumatizing real life experience. Your thoughts, please. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I was just saying in answer to the other question, that there are certain things that we create this reality that is very engaging. And people do it. Their sole game, purpose of the entertainment game people are to get people to use the games over and over again. And they can test that so easily. What types of things engage people? And then once you're into the world, you know, you're, you're, it's into you. And then it has these consequences. Yeah. And, uh, this is, it, it's disturbing. Um, when I taught in China, Virgil referred to that. Students said to me, oh, my grandparents say I'm playing games too much. It's going to influence my brain and be bad for me. So, well, it's certainly going to influence your brain. You know, whether it's going to be bad for you depends in part on what it is that the game has in it or what you're doing online. Screen time in itself isn't what's bad. People say a kid's spending too much screen time. I say, well, what if they're on their Kindle reading the great classics for three hours a day? Is that bad screen time? No, it depends what they're doing on the screen time and the people who are creating the experience for them. 
And this description of those games is, you know, exactly what's so potentially mm -hmm. alarming. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think our time is up, right, Virgil? And I would like to thank our guest for such an extensive lecture and deep questions, deep going questions. I personally was overwhelmed by um, the talk. It activated my brain like nothing else in post pandemic times. Okay, <laughs> so thank you so very much, Professor Wexler. Thank you from the Fulbright Association. Well, thank you for having and, me. Yes. Yes, thank you, Dr. Wexler. Uh, the problem is that I will have to uh, watch the uh, recorded session again to get all the different details. I really enjoyed it tremendously. Thank you. Uh, thank everybody okay. for your attention because I covered a lot of ground. And part of the excitement is the emergent property of bringing together the information from so many different sources. And it takes time to digest it. And thank you, Virgil. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to look at it myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you so thank much. You. And bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Fiona. Bye.